I said we were going to be talking about the beginning of the conservation movement and the preservation movement. And I suppose before we get into that, I should explain the difference. Preservation is the idea that uh, nature, that natural areas should be sort of uh, held in reserve and not allowed, to, not allowed to change, kept just as they are with no development uh, and with no human infringement or as little human infringement as possible to preserve them as they are. Uh, conservation, on the other hand, calls for the use of resources, but the responsible use of resources in a sustainable way so that those resources, whatever they may be, whether it's timber or water or whatever, uh, can, be, uh, can be saved uh, in the sense uh, that they can be uh, uh, continually replenished and continually used by not using them all up all, all at once. So very uh, similar in a lot of ways and very different in a lot of ways. Now, this idea of conservation, as we have discussed, was not an idea that was really foremost on the minds, or on the minds at all, of the early colonists, because resources seemed to be inexhaustible. But they began to be exhausted. They seemed to be boundless, but they began to be bound. The frontier seemed to be endless, but eventually the frontier itself ended, which brings us back again to Frederick Jackson Turner. By the 1890s, there was in the uh, contiguous United States really no more frontier. So that idea of continually moving westward to get more resources, more land, uh, and so forth in order to improve one's social position was no longer a possibility. So what does that mean? Uh, that was kind of an existential question in the 1890s that was responded to in various different ways. But uh, so far as what it meant for the environment, that question had already been posed by someone, uh, by several someones actually, but in particular, uh, the first time in a really big way was by George Perkins Marsh, who was a, uh, a diplomat and scientist from New England who in 1864 wrote a book called Man and Nature, or The Earth as Modified by Human Action. And in that book, he laid out the argument that essentially humans were capable of destroying their habitat, of destroying their home. And, and he used as, as a historical example several Mediterranean civilizations that had fallen and made the argument that it was because of their misuse of their resources. That is what led to their eventual collapse. And in fact, he warned that the United States and the world in general at that time, the 1860s, was in danger of something similar because of deforestation. He warned that deforestation could lead to an area being turned into a desert. He said, quote, The operation of causes set in action by men has brought the earth to a desolation almost as complete as that of the moon. End quote. Now, this was a very influential book. It uh, impacted uh, a lot of people. And it really, by, by, uh, by many, is considered the beginning of the modern conservation movement. So a lot of different types of people responded to the message of George Perkins Marsh, the message that, you know, we have to take care of, of nature or else uh, it will be gone. Uh, groups such as sportsmen, because they wanted, you know, they, they wanted some, uh, um, some, some wilderness in which to hunt, right? Hikers wanted some place to hike. Artists wanted some place to paint. Uh, scientists and foresters were deeply concerned. Women's groups were concerned. 
in the late 19th century, it became uh, fairly common for uh, organizations to be formed of middle class women uh, that were um, focused on societal reform of one kind or another, and that included some women's groups that were focused on the environment and conservation. Also, bird watchers. Got to have a place to watch the birds, right? Um, including the formation of the Audubon Society in 1905, uh, dedicated to the preservation of the habitat of birds, naming itself after uh, the famous uh, painter and uh, ornithologist John James Audubon, whose name at birth was actually Jean-Jacques Robin. He was originally French, uh, moved to the United States, and in the 1820s and 30s set about uh, his mission to paint every species of birds in North America. Uh, so the Audubon Society, uh, named after him long after he had passed away, uh, is one of the uh, still foremost uh, environmental, uh, environmentally active organizations. Now, a lot of this, uh, this interest and concern in conservation and in nature led to the formation and the ex its expression in journals and magazines, such as in 1871, American Sportsman, 1873, Forest and Stream. 1874, a journal called The Field and Stream, uh, which later, 1895, became the magazine Field and Stream. American Angler, 1881. These magazines um, are still around, and uh, so are many others from that, uh, from that era, uh, and demonstrate the uh, sort of the breadth of types of people who were concerned about the environment. So here we're talking about hunters and fishermen. By the way, magazines like Field and Stream and American Sportsman, in addition to having articles about how to hunt, how to fish, uh, have at various times made other contributions to uh, American culture and global culture. Uh, for example, Ernest Hemingway, uh, many of his early short stories set in Michigan, his native Michigan, that were about hunting, appeared in these magazines. All right, well, um, the big changes started to take place in the Progressive Era, which was a reaction against the Gilded Age. Now, I could spend easily, probably, you know, two months uh, uh, worth of lectures talking just about those two things, just about that sentence that I just said. So I'm going to try to summarize it uh, for our needs here uh, with, the, uh, with the knowledge that I go into much more detail in my basic American history class. Uh, the Gilded Age was roughly around 1870 to the 1890s, and it was that time period when um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of economic activity, a lot of millionaires being made, robber barons, as sometimes they were called, um, very much a laissez-faire attitude toward business. Let it, uh, let it be, leave it alone. The invisible hand of the market and all that Adam Smith type stuff. Um, also a time when there was a lot of income inequality, when workers had very few rights. Uh, and that led to the populist movement in the 1890s, which was a reaction against those excesses. Of course, gilded age, gilded, I mean, something looks like it's made of gold, but it's not. It's really only gold on the surface. So the populist movement leading to the de development of the populist party um, was a uh, uh, eventually a political movement to sort of undo those those excesses, which led to the changes uh, that took place in the progressive era, which was roughly 1900 to 1920, really 1901 to 1920, because it started when Teddy Roosevelt became president, uh, 
and it lasted through the presidencies of Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. Um, and during that time, uh, the progressive movement was marked by a lot of emphasis on expertise and a lot of emphasis on uh, an activist government, on government regulations. Uh, a lot of modern regulations came into, uh, came into place during that time, from the Food and Drug Administration to the NCAA in sports. Um, and away from that unfettered, unregulated approach to business and, uh, you know, the, uh, the reign of monopolies and those sorts of things. Uh, by the way, progressive was, uh, well, a little bit different from how we think of it now. Um, during that period, both Democrats and Republicans became progressive. In fact, the 1912 presidential election between William Howard Taft running for re-election as a Republican, Woodrow Wilson running against him as the Democrat, Teddy Roosevelt uh, running as a third-party candidate uh, for the uh, new progressive party, alias the Bull Moose Party, and Eugene Debs as the socialist, all of them were progressives. Uh, all of them were left of center to one degree or another. And that's kind of how things went during this 20-year period. So remember that. Progressivism means emphasis on expertise and government regulation and the movement away from that uh, laissez-faire approach. Well, uh, an important individual to talk about from this time period is this guy, Bernard Fernau, who was of uh, uh, German heritage, so in his native Prussia, his name would have been pronounced Bernhard Fernauf, um, was uh, the first chief of the Division of Forestry that was established in 1886. And he had a vision of a national forest system in the United States, similar to what his native Prussia had, uh, not only for the, uh, the sake of... Uh, you know, just uh, improving the landscape or sustaining the landscape, but also, more importantly, to protect watersheds uh, and prevent that desertification uh, that had been uh, warned against by Marsh. He was, uh, by many, he is by many considered to be the uh, first person to engage in scientific forest management. Uh, scientific management in general, something that had... Uh, come into vogue in the 1890s. So this is an application of that to forestry. Wrote a book in 1902 called The Economics of Forestry, in which he introduced his concept, uh, his, his answer to laissez-faire, which laissez-faire literally means let it do or let it be. Uh, his approach uh, and what he thought the government should, uh, should do was fair marché which means, well, fair marché can mean go to market, actually, in French, but it can also mean make it go, make it walk, um, make it work, in other words. So he's calling for the opposite of laissez-faire. He's calling for the government to step in and make things work, particularly where uh, conservation of natural resources and especially forests were concerned. Uh, his goal was to be more efficient, more utilitarian. He believed that Americans were way too wasteful. He believed that resources should be used efficiently so as to provide the maximum good to the maximum number of people. Well, I mentioned Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt was uh, very much a nature lover and always had been. Uh, and he was very much influenced by these, uh, these calls for conservation to the extent that during his second administration, he called a conference at the White House, the White House Conference on Conservation, 1908, uh, which would become an annual meeting with a different theme every year and uh, now is known as the annual governor's meeting where all the governors meet at the White House. So, uh, President Roosevelt was involved, and so was Fernow's successor, uh, 
in what was now called the U.S. Forest Service, um, Gifford Pinchot, uh, who wrote The Conservation Ethic. Uh, Pinchot, remarkably uh, important in the, uh, uh, the history of conservation and of forestry. So during this, uh, this conference, President Roosevelt gave a speech, Conservation as a National Duty. Not just something we probably kind of ought to do, something we must do as our duty. And it led to the founding of the National Conservation Commission that answered to the president. Now, uh, perhaps you've heard the expression bully pulpit, uh, which was coined by Teddy Roosevelt. It is uh, the presidency is a bully pulpit. Uh, that is to say, bully in the sense of wonderful, not bullying somebody. Uh, but an ideal opportunity to uh, get the attention of the public. When the president says something, it gets reported on. It gets talked about. People hear about it. So, with Roosevelt putting so much emphasis and spending so much time talking about conservation in this way, it made the public... Uh, aware that such a thing even was that such an idea existed and of the importance of it uh, and uh, that uh, really kind of helped to propel the conservation movement all right here's um, someone else that like uh, George Perkins Marsh uh, Marsh was saying some of these things long before the progressive era his name was John Wesley Powell and in 1878 he wrote the report on the lands of the arid region of the United States, uh, in which basically he's, uh, he's writing scientifically about the big difference between the, the, the U.S. east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi, that difference being rainfall, as we have previously discussed. Uh, he said that um, it was very unwise to try to farm the extremely arid areas. That also he believed that uh, timberlands should be set aside uh, for commercial use and to provide a watershed echoing, uh, well, not echoing, but presaging uh, Fern, uh, Fernow. Um, but this, this whole idea about it being a bad idea to use farming techniques uh, that worked back east in the arid west. That's not something that anybody wanted to hear in 1878, especially the railroads, because the railroads were making inroads into the west right at this very time, and it was in their best interests that uh, as many people engage in farming as possible because, you know, that provides business to the railroad to transport those agricultural goods. Uh, this is why, as we talked about last time, uh, railroads were even, you know, making land available to people. Powell said, quote, Gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights, for there is not sufficient water to supply the land. No one wanted to hear it then, but... By the time the progressive era was getting underway, people were starting to listen, uh, to pay attention to people like, uh, uh, like Marsh and Powell. And in 1902, a uh, congressman, Democratic congressman from Nevada, Francis Newlands, introduced several of Powell's suggestions that he had made more than 20 years before to Congress, uh, this time with the support of the president, Teddy Roosevelt. And it passed. Uh, it passed, I think, in June of 1902, the Reclamation Act of 1902, that uh, called for the federal government to set aside funds from the sales of public land and use those funds for irrigation projects in the West, in those arid regions. Uh, Powell was still alive, Barely. He died three months later after this uh, act was passed. All right. 
Well, the next thing that we're going to talk about, and uh, Powell is leading us into that, is water law. So we're going to take a look, just as we did at land policy, we're going to take a look at water policy back east and how it would differ in the arid west. Water law in the original 13 states and later in all the new states east of the Mississippi and even just west of the Mississippi in the, the Midwest uh, was basically an extension of riparian law from English common law. And uh, that's what the approach is called, riparian law, uh, that is followed in the eastern half of the U.S. Riparian coming from a word meaning uh, pertaining to riverbanks. So this is uh, uh, also sometimes referred to as the rocking chair law. So this is how it was in England. This is how it was in uh, the, the first states until uh, settlement of the West. So basically what this says is if your property is next to a river, you can use the water or not. Up to you, whatever you choose. Um, you can not use it. You can just uh, sit in your rocking chair and watch the river flow by. Um, you can do whatever you want with it, essentially. Or don't do anything, as long as you don't affect the people living downstream from you. So, you know, you can't divert it uh, because that, uh, that would affect the people downstream. But basically, anything else that you want to do. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, with uh, uh, a slight modification that arrived in uh, some state laws in the East in the early 1800s. Now remember, the early 1800s, that's when the Industrial Revolution is getting geared up in the United States, uh, particularly in New England. And remember also that the early factories, before the invention of the uh, steam engine and so forth, the early factories were powered by water. So uh, this uh, slight adjustment was called appropriation. And what that said was that industries can use water. They can even divert the water or appropriate the water, uh, even if it affects people downstream. They're allowed to do that because their business is for, quote, the benefit of all. So... Uh, this is a very pro-business thing, very pro-commerce. You want to have jobs. You want to have business bringing in money. Therefore, they get, essentially, special rights. Uh, they can use the water, um, whether it affects people downstream or not. Now, appropriation, that idea of using water if it affects people downstream, uh, is something that gets done in the western states, uh, where it is... Uh, uh, called prior appropriation and is also referred to as the Colorado Doctrine. So a couple of easy ways to remember how this works is first in time, first in right. So whoever's there first, whoever's there first has the right to the water. But then the second half of this is use it or lose it. Um, if you don't use the water, if you sit in your rocking chair and watch it go by, then you lose those rights. So uh, to demonstrate this, I have my very high-tech illustration I put together. So let's say you're a dude, you're dude A, uh, and you have a farm here on this river, this unnamed river. There's your farm, see? Uh, so you got a farm, and later on, another dude, we'll call him, dude B, comes along upstream from you and builds a factory. Can they divert that water uh, into their factory and therefore away from you? It all depends. Okay, so you got there first. You got there first, so you have the rights to the water. But let's say you got your farm there and you don't use this water to irrigate your farm or for any other practical purpose other than the fact it's flowing past your farm, uh, 
you haven't used it, then dude B can divert the water. If, however, you have been using the water uh, to irrigate your farm, uh, dude B cannot divert it. Now, dude B comes along first, well, as long as he's using that water, he can do whatever he wants, even if you come along later and have a farm. Now, if that factory stops using the water, if that factory closes down, uh, and then they build a new factory there, someone else does, uh, then uh, things have changed, and now you were there first before the new owners of that old factory, so you get the, uh, the primacy there. Uh, for that. So that's called the Colorado Doctrine. About half the states in the West uh, go by that. The other half go by what is called the California Doctrine. That's kind of a combination of riparian and prior appropriation. Um, and it's called the California Doctrine because this is based on a California State Supreme Court case back in 1886. The situation that had developed was that there were these cattle ranchers who had uh, for a long time been driving their cattle to the river to drink, to water their herd. Um, however, there was a, uh, a farmer upstream who was wanting to divert the water to irrigate his crops. Now, the, the ranchers claimed riparian law. Uh, they weren't necessarily using the water for anything except for their, their cattle to drink. But they were there first, whereas the farmer argued that uh, according to appropriation or prior appropriation, he was making beneficial use of the water, and they weren't, so it went to the court. And the court decided, well, actually, they both theoretically have a right to the water. It comes down, therefore, to primacy and right, uh, and that comes down to timing. What happened first? The purchase of the land or the use of the water. And that's a good way to uh, keep all these things straight. Riparian law is who purchased the property first. The Colorado Doctrine, uh, or prior appropriation, is who was the first to actually use the water. The California Doctrine, or the hybrid approach, is who was the first to either buy the property or use the water. So here is a map that shows where each of these uh, approaches is used still today. Uh, you can see the green states uh, are the areas that use the traditional riparian law, and that's everybody east of the Great Plains except Florida. Uh, Florida, you'll, you'll see it describes their approach as statutory. Florida has a lot of different statutes and regulations concerning water because there are so many different ways to use water in Florida. There are the, uh, the wetlands, there's beaches, there's water parks, there's agriculture. So like in a lot of other areas, Florida is kind of a case of its own. So uh, let's, just, uh, let's just agree to say Florida is kind of weird in this regard uh, and look at, uh, look at the other states. So once you get... Uh, across the Mississippi and through that first band of trans-Mississippi states to the states uh, of the Great Plains. That's where you see these two other approaches being used. The Colorado Doctrine, uh, first in time, first in right, use it or lose it. New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. The California Doctrine, the hybrid approach, who was the first to use the water or buy the land. California, Oregon, Washington, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and North and South Dakota. All right, now we're going to talk uh, about uh, a specific, specific incident or series of incidents demonstrating just how, how important uh, water is in the Southwest and how far-reaching the consequences of the struggle for it can be. Something that's uh, known as the California Water Wars took place in the 1920s, and it involved the Owens Valley. The arrow is pointing to the valley. The valley is that little thin area, that thin valley running in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Uh, it involves the uh, 
Owens Valley and Owens Lake that is located there, and far to the south, the city of Los Angeles. So let's take a look at Los Angeles. Uh, 1790, their population was 131 people. Uh, by 1850, shortly after California became part of the U.S., there were about 1,600 people in Los Angeles. Uh, next uh, decade, that tripled. Uh, then it took 20 years for that, uh, for that then to double to 11,000 in 1880. Quite a few more people coming in in the 1880s, so that by 1890 there were 50,000. And in 1892, oil, oil was discovered uh, near Los Angeles. And uh, in fact, uh, California was producing about one quarter of the world's oil output by 1923, something that most folks aren't aware of. People tend to think of Texas and Oklahoma, but California was a really big oil place as well. And after that happened, the population doubled by 1900 to 100,000. Ten years later, 300,000. Ten years later, in 1920, almost 700,000. Ten years after that, 1.2 million. So in the course of 30 years, it went from 100,000 to 1.2 million. That's a lot of people a lot of people in an area that's pretty arid that had previously been supporting a relatively small number of people. All right, now here are the two major players in this story. Frederick Eaton, and this is a picture of him as a younger man. Uh, Frederick Eaton actually became the head of the Los Angeles Water Department, which was privately owned, and eventually I think he was in charge of it, um, in 1875. Uh, then, uh, more than 20 years later, he became the mayor of Los Angeles. It's uh, while he was in charge of the L.A. Uh, uh, water uh, system in 1878, he first met the engineer William Mulholland, uh, and they were close associates for decades afterwards, so that by the turn of the century, by 1900, Eaton is the mayor, and William Mulholland is the chief engineer of the L.A. Department of Water and power, which is now controlled by the county. Uh, Eaton only served as mayor for that one two-year term, but after that, he was an extremely powerful behind-the-scenes financial and political figure in Los Angeles. And he devised this idea of how to get more water to the city of Los Angeles, uh, to bring the water to them uh, and he had in mind Lake, Lake Owen, which he had uh, seen when he was camping in the Sierra Nevadas many years earlier. And so the idea was put forward to build an aqueduct to carry the water from the Owens Valley, Lake Owens, all the way down to Los Angeles, with William Mulholland being in charge, being the engineer in charge of uh, overseeing, planning, and, and constructing that aqueduct. Well, remember that Water Reclamation Act of 1902 that we just talked about? A lot of federal agents had been, uh, uh, after that uh, act was passed, a lot of federal agents had been contacting the farmers in the Owens Valley. Uh, trying to uh, get them to sign over rights to some of their land for uh, these public works for the overall benefit of uh, the entire state. And Eaton showed up and was uh, also making inquiries about buying land. And the farmers assumed he was part of that Reclamation Act force and he never let them know any differently, knowing that they thought that. And so they were actually, without realizing it, signing their land over to him personally. So that's how he got, or not the, not the land rather, but the water rights, signing the water over to him personally. So um, he got access, therefore, to their water and then uh, was behind the building of that aqueduct that would carry the water from Owens Lake there in the Owens Valley down uh, 
to Los Angeles. However, on the way down through Los Angeles, it happened to uh, pass through the San Fernando Valley and was watering the, uh, uh, watering the valley there, uh, which was um, secretly, the land being secretly bought up by Eaton, uh, a syndicate of investors that was uh, basically Eaton and his friends that were buying up that property which uh, was going to become a whole lot more valuable because it's getting heavily irrigated. And then he used his political pull to extend the borders of Metro Los Angeles uh, to include the San Fernando Valley. So it became part of the city. And this whole thing was, you know, about getting water to the city. He also used his pull with the local newspapers to get them to manufacture a drought. So there wasn't actually a drought. It was kind of an average rainfall year, but the papers kept running articles about how there was a drought and people believed it. And that made it easier to get the public approval to have this, uh, this whole uh, uh, thing set up with the aqueduct and bringing in the water, which required a lot of money to do. And the money was put up by the county. Uh, however, the money was being made by Eaton and his associates because this property that they had secretly, privately been buying up um, was all of a sudden worth a huge, huge fortune. Now, uh, the result of this was that for the farmers up in the uh, Owens Valley, their whole lake that they had uh, used to irrigate their crops was basically moved to California. Uh, then other water sources uh, were found. Reservoir was built, but uh, uh, the first thing to go was their lake, which meant that also their farms. So by the 1920s, when the farmers had figured out what was going on and that their lake was drying up, uh, they uh, took out their frustrations on the aqueduct. Uh, they uh, attempted to blow it up a couple of different times, and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of violence between the farmers and the authorities. Uh, the authorities basically, um, this being a time when I know it's hard to imagine, but California in general and especially Los Angeles was was very corrupt. Uh, the authorities were backing up the uh, the power brokers, and so the farmers the farmers just eventually lost out. By 1926, there was no Owens Lake. It was completely dry, and agriculture in that whole valley was dead. And here's a picture of what used to be the lake. It's an alkali flat, uh, the site of frequent dust storms, sort of like, a, uh, kind of like a ghost town uh, of sorts, but without the town. However, with plenty of ghosts, apparently. Um, ghosts of the broken dreams of the farmers. Now, Mulholland, and by the way, Mulholland was very, very uh, uh, influential. Uh, in fact, uh, you've probably heard of Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles. It's named for him. Uh, Mulholland and Eaton finally had a falling out right around the time this lake dried up because Mulholland uh, was working on building a dam to create a reservoir to be able to get more water for Los Angeles because they'd used up the lake. And the plan was uh, to build this dam on a site owned by Eaton, but then uh, Eaton uh, sort of like uh, put, the, uh, put the screws to the city again uh, and demanded a million dollars to let them use his property. Uh, and they, uh, they didn't go for that, so they were forced to build the dam in a different location the St. Francis Dam. So they had to do this kind of, uh, kind of hurriedly, and turns out uh, there was a problem with the bedrock on that location, and it wasn't really able to sustain a dam. And uh, tiny cracks started appearing in the dam not long after it was built, uh, which Mulholland kind of like, you know, just basically said, well, that's no big deal, except it was because the dam broke. Uh, 
and 450 people were drowned in the area. And that was a huge black eye for Eaton and Mulholland. Now, all this stuff that I just talked about, the aqueduct, the water wars, the St. Francis Dam, all uh, play a, a large part in the plot of the 1974 um, hard-boiled noir mystery movie Chinatown uh, with Jack Nicholson and, and Faye Dunaway. It is sort of the background to the uh, overall mystery that that the uh, detective here is, is trying to solve. And it's, it's, a, it's a very good film. I show it uh, in class, usually, when we're meeting in person. If you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it lately, you should go out and watch it after you, uh, after you finish this with the information in mind that we've just talked about and be thinking about how not only those uh, events are portrayed, but also sort of the deeper meaning of it all. Now, in the movie, the uh, character of Hollis Mulway, uh, played uh, by uh, played by John Houston, um, represents. I'm sorry, Noah Cross. Noah Cross is played by John Houston, uh, and that is essentially the Frederick Eaton character. Hollis Mulway uh, is William Mulholland. He's more of a minor character in the film but uh, Noah Cross slash Frederick Eaton is kind of the uh, the epitome of an extraordinarily greedy and self-centered person uh, who puts his own interests ahead of all the interests of nature and if you watch the film you'll realize that I'm talking about more than just water there so uh, maybe that will pique your interest if you haven't seen the movie or thought about it in a while. Anyway, uh, there is uh, there's an old expression out west, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. And that has proved to be the case. <laughs>